Okay, so uh, you ask how I became a historian, and it's a great question. And, um, and I actually talked about that a little bit in um, my book, Family Properties. Um, and I think, I, I really think how I became a historian um, had to do with my family and uh, the situation that I grew up in, which is that um, I'm the youngest of five, and um, my father died when I was six, and um, I grew up then with my mother and my siblings, and there was some story around him and his passing that I just didn't understand, and I wanted to know. And I remember distinctly when he, he died when I was six, uh, summer of 1965, and um, a year later, my family had shrunken from seven people, like two adults and five kids, to four people. Um, one adult, my mother, and three girls. My two older brothers left for college within that year that my father died. And so it was a dramatic change. And we went from living in a single family home to a two flat uh, in a different part of the city that was nowhere near as nice as where we'd been before. And, um, and I was very little when all this was going on. And I, it just, I couldn't take it in, you know? And so I remember by the time I was like eight or nine realizing, I don't understand how I got here exactly. I know something happened, but I don't, I just don't get it, you know? I mean, I know my father died and I, I couldn't even remember which year exactly, you know, because I was such a little kid that it was hard for me to quantify, you know, had, been, had he been gone one year or two or three, I, you know, I couldn't tell. And it upset me and I felt like, I gotta know. You know, I can't just be floating in space not knowing how I got here or why we're here or who had to do with what. And so uh, but in fifth grade, I started to keep a diary. And it was a very conscious effort to keep track of what's going on so I don't get confused. You know, not that I was confused about my life, but I was uh, confused about time in a way. And I wanted to capture it and know what happened when. And I had this desire to, to get a handle on it. And so um, for a while, you know, I tried to write every day so that I would uh, be able to know. So that if in four years I was confused, what actually happened in fifth grade? <laughs> I'd be able to look and see. And I thought that was helpful. Um, so that also, of course, helped me write, you know, because I wrote a lot. And... Um, but it was this sort of uh, hearing the whispers of the adults around me and knowing something had happened around my father, but I didn't know what, um, did get me interested in the past as a source of knowledge and grounding that people really ought to have. And, um, but my actual love was more literature. Um, I was always a great reader and really enjoyed reading and really enjoyed writing and um, loved novels. Uh, and I might have gone into somehow literary study or writing literature even possibly, um, except for the second big influence on why I became a historian, which is um, feminism. So when I was um, uh, 13 is when, I think it was 1972, is when Ms. Magazine came out with its first um, volume. And I distinctly remember on the cover of Ms. Magazine was a blue woman with like 10 arms on either side of her. And one was holding a iron, one was holding a typewriter, one was holding a, you know, they're all holding different you know, objects that were supposed to represent her multiple roles. And at this point I was, you know, 13. My mother uh, had been trying to provide for us for single-handedly for a while. And, and I always felt like I never saw anything that represented my mother's experience, much less my own, um, in media or anywhere. Um, because mothers at that point still were supposed to be married to a husband who was supposed to take care of them and you know that was what the media showed more or less but my mother worked and worked hard and worked at multiple roles and was always tired and um, trying her best at, you know and I could see the stress but I never saw it acknowledged so when I saw the Ms. Magazine cover I thought wow this is the first real thing I've ever seen I mean it's like this is, this is real, I have to look at this. I was so excited, and I thought, this is like my mother. And uh, I got the magazine somehow, I don't know if I bought it, and I didn't have much money, but uh, I decided I was a feminist right then, that's it, you know, and uh, at the age of 13. And that was a good time to become a feminist, because 
it saves, I think, young women if they could, if, I always feel so blessed and lucky that I grew up in the 70s when these things were coming out and telling young women that they could question and they could be strong and they could, and it was exciting and there was a movement and, um, and there were new things coming out all the time. And I started reading this stuff and I got, you know, really interested and I read you know, all the classics as they came out. I read Against Our Will, Men, Women, and Rape. I think it came out in 75 and I was 16. I, um, and then I thought, oh my God, there's this terrible thing and no one ever wrote about it. And um, I immediately took a self-defense class and, you know, and I felt like it made me strong and it made me confident and it was fun. And um, so I was reading these feminist books as a teenager. And I... And one of the things, I grew up actually, um, even though my father passed away, um, my parents were, my, fa my mother was, I'm the youngest of five, my mother was 40 when I was born and my father was 42. So they were an older generation. And there was, um, and, the, and the roles in the family were, you know, supposed to be that the father provides and the mother's the housewife, but it didn't work out because of my father um, dying young. Um, but nevertheless, uh, in a family of five, it was um, not uncommon for me to be told that I couldn't do things because girls didn't do it. And my brothers could and I couldn't. And I heard that all the time. And I'd say, you know, why can't I go on a hiking trip or something? And they'd say, well, you know, that's not really a good thing for girls to do. Boys do that. And I was like, why not? And they'd like, girls never did this. You know, and I thought, never? Ever? You know, there was never a moment when women did anything but were, what I'm stuck here in the suburbs, you know, doing. I mean, it didn't make sense, really. You know, I thought there must have been some time when, you know, we did, we were free. Because I kind of wanted, you know, as a teenager, I, I, I was sort of felt adventurous and I wanted to be an explorer. I wanted to do cool things. And I was always told girls don't do that. And I, I thought my options in life were secretary, stewardess, teacher, or mother. I remember distinctly thinking, well, you know, those are the four things. And I thought, oh, I don't really want to be a mother and I don't really want to be a teacher. I thought, the most exciting is stewardess. I'm going to be a stewardess. That was, that's what I thought. So, um, so to find out that there may be possibly more options, that there's something wrong with, uh, you know, this idea that we only had four options and the boys had the rest of the world, um, it really struck me. And I, uh, so, so I was excited about this. I was interested in the past. And um, a good reader and a good writer, and then I, um, I think I, I think the, what's the name of the book. Um, I don't remember now. It was a kind of a goofy book. The first it's called the first sex. The first sex, I think, it was by Elizabeth Gould, and it was like a pop book. It wasn't a serious history, but it was all about. Um, I came across it in my reading, and it was all about like how the first you know the goddesses of the ancient world and all these roles for women in history. And I was totally excited about it. I thought, my God, there is women in history, you know? And, um, and I thought, you know, I'm not really a public kind of person. I don't really like to be out in the streets telling people what to do. I don't really like telling anyone what to do, but I do like reading and writing. So I thought, well, if I could write history, I could, um, do you know do my part I could help make change but I don't have to be nagging people to come out to a meeting I could just say you know I could just do my research and people could be inspired and they could live their lives and um, and have more options so I thought that would be an exciting thing to do and that's what I wanted to do and uh, so um, even though I would have rather spent my time reading novels like I said <laughs> um, I thought you know this would be a way to read and write and understand the past and actually open things up because it's still the 70s now. So I went to uh, undergraduate um, University of Chicago. I'm from Chicago and that was sort of where smart kids in Chicago went to school. Um, and this was the time, I mean, I applied to three, three colleges. Uh, now the kids apply to so many. Um, one was Brown, and I only applied because my brother David had also applied, and they had rejected him. So I thought, oh, let me try it. They rejected me also. So that was that. And then Michigan, because I knew somebody there, and University of Michigan, and I applied, and University of Chicago, and I got in those two places, went to Chicago. And Chicago at that time was um, at least three quarters of the student body was male. It was a profoundly sexist place. Um, I uh, was reading these feminist books, and I was majoring in history and studying. I, took, I mean, I was just an undergrad, but I 
I took um, a course on the English Civil War, and I took, you know, the history of Western Civ and those things that they offered, and there were no women in those classes. None, you know? And I'm reading this stuff at the same time, and I uh, raised my hand in the Western Civ class, which was a full year class, and I said, oh, you know, how come we're not covering any women here? Are there any women in the history of Western civilization? And the teacher said, we will get to that in the 19th century with the suffrage movement. <laughs> 19th century. Till then, we were in ancient Greece. Nothing. And I was uh, outraged, you know, and uh, thought this was awful. And I, I said, well, you know, it's just making sense. Again, I mean, there's got to be something, you know. And, and having read the Elizabeth Gould book, you know, I thought it's probably a lot, you know. So I... Um, I remember I wrote a paper for that class. It was History of Western Civ, and I wrote it about women in the Middle Ages. And I, you know, there was a little bit out there, and I wrote about, you know, all the discriminatory, just put it mildly, laws and all the restrictions on them and all these things. And I wrote it for my Western Civ class. And the teacher, I got it back, and he wrote, I remember the exact words he wrote on my paper. Then, as now, there were henpecked husbands mother-dominated sons, you know, shrewish women, and you are making it sound like, well, all these women are victims, and, you know, this is really wrong. And the quote, the direct quote is, then is now there were henpecked husbands and mother-dominated sons, and that's what I remembered. And I thought, you know, I don't think this is the place for me. You know, I don't think I should stay at the school. And I, um, uh, I tried to, I thought, well, can I create a major for myself and study women, do some kind of women's studies thing. And being in an overwhelmingly male environment, um, like my classes, it was usually one or two women at most and 12 men. Sometimes I was the only woman in class. Um, I um, had thought about uh, creating my own major that would be some kind of, I knew I couldn't do women's history because they didn't have any women's history, but I thought maybe I can do women's studies-ish. And this is 70, by the way. I started in the fall of 77 as an undergrad. So we're talking 77, 78. And uh, I said, I'd like to do that. Is there a possibility? And they said, well, for that, you need six courses, you know, to do a, a, a little minor field. And by the way, University of Chicago is on a quarter system, not, not semester. So that means there's three courses a year. So I only needed six to have a minor of some sort. But they said, unfortunately, we do not have six courses in the entire university that deal with women. And they were counting a course on human biology as a women's course, women's studies course, which I couldn't care less about. They were counting, um, I think there were two women in literature courses, and maybe one by um, Wendy Doniger O'Flaherty, who was teaching in, um, uh, did uh, history of religion, and she had some things about women in religion. And they said, sorry, it doesn't add up to six. You're out of luck. Can't do it. I was like, this is ridiculous, you know? <laughs> and um, luckily, because I'm enough of, I was already, you know, I mean, I was just a kid, I was enough of a feminist to say, like, I'm sorry, guys, this isn't good. You know, you shouldn't be treating me this way, and you shouldn't be treating women this way, and this is not good. So I applied to um, Barnard, and I didn't know anything about Barnard. I didn't know it was an Ivy League school. I'd never even heard of it. But um, Barnard College is part of Columbia University, and... But somehow I was looking to see who has women's history, and they had it. I thought, well, okay, I'll go there, you know. So I, um, I had also gone to New York. Uh, I had a, a friend who was a New Yorker, and my freshman year I had gone to New York, and I was like, wow, this is a really cool place. But I had not seen Columbia. I hadn't gone that far. I was only there for like three days. And um, so I applied to Barnard, and I got accepted to transfer. And then I remember I met with the dean or somebody at the University of Chicago, and I said, you know, I'm leaving. And they said, well, why? And I said, it's because I want to study women's history and it's not possible here. And they said, um, well, where are you going? And I said, you know, Barnard. And, they, uh, and, they, and then they said something to me like, well, you know, we don't do that because here you get a classical education. We don't go in for fads. And women's history is a fad. And we are above that. And we want you to know that, um, you know, if you, you know, you're a good student, you're, you know, got A's. If you ever want to come back, if you go there and you don't like it because it's too fatty and silly, then you know you are welcome to come back. And I said to them, you know what? I said, no matter how bad it is there, I am not coming back here. 
(laughs) (laughs) Because I was pretty disgusted with them, you know. And the funny thing is, the University of Chicago, now I I became a women's historian, and when you, um, they actually were a hotbed of women's rights activism at the turn of the last century. They were very progressive in the 1890s, and in their library, they had all this stuff about what is called the first wave of feminism, and like nothing on the second. And in the end, University of Chicago never created a women's studies program. They skipped right to gender studies, which is okay. You know, it's men and women. You know, it's fine. But I just thought it was ironic that they, when they finally got on board, they did it in this other way. But fine. So that's how I became a historian. It was, uh, you know, a combination of personal desire to, un- to personal understanding that history mattered, political understanding that um, feminism and women's history mattered, and my skill set. And being constantly uh, confronted by such extreme sexism that I couldn't help but just say, oh, forget you guys. I'm going to go my own way. And I went to Barnard, and I loved Barnard. And um, I felt like I'd you know, died and gone to heaven because you know, I got to live in New York City. And um, there were all these, you know, it was an all-women's school. And there were all these pioneering women's historians there. And I just took all the women's history I could. And um, that's how I... Uh, started to be a historian. Of course, later I wrote the book that I'm more known for is the book about my father. But first, uh, that was not my initial impulse to find out about him in particular. It was more the broader feeling that the past influences the present and it would be a good thing to know what it, what, what happened. Well, how do you understand what you encountered in Chicago. I mean, there was abundant evidence at the beginning of the 20th century of the intelligence and leadership capacity of women. Uh, There's the celebrated story of Jane Addams and Dewey, where where Dewey writes this letter and says, you know, I thought about what you said all night, and you're right, you're not wrong, and it matters. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Uh, so, what how did happened? They, yeah, how did it implode? Yeah, I, I mean, it's not like it had always been that way. Well, that's the story you, of history. That's when you met it in right. 70. Well, that's exactly what history tells you. You know, that there's no such thing as progress. Uh, that is a complete myth. Uh, it's just a constant contestation um, over, you know, visions of justice, and um, the university of the University of Chicago turns out to be a good example of a place that, you know, has its ebbs and flows of progressivism and, and conservatism. And um, I did not know that history, of course, when I started there. I had no idea that it ever had anything to do with women. I found that out, you know, and I sort of noticed there was. If I looked for women, it was all this one period and nothing else. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's not, how did it happen? It happened through the backlash of the post-1920s uh, United States culture, um, which once women got the vote, the idea was that they had what they needed. And um, the women's movement splintered. And the 20s was a very reactionary decade. And I mean, I could tell you that history. They were, um, all these women's activist groups and peace groups were targeted as um, pro-socialist because they were anti-war and the Women's League for Peace and Freedom and all these women's peace pacifist organizations were um, you know harassed and um, this Brigadier General created a, a spider web chart sh- showing all the connections of like from the PTA to you know mothers groups to Jane Addams uh, that they were all part of a massive uh, socialist conspiracy and needed to be stopped that happened um, and then the whole culture you know, became increasingly misogynistic in the 20s. At the same time as women were making progress, there was also a beginning of a backlash. And in the 30s, women were blamed for the Depression, and laws were passed firing women, married women from governmental employee and employees, um, from, the, from those sorts of jobs, on the idea that um, if they're married, their husbands should take care of them. And, so they, and then those jobs, those laws were copied by private industry. And so women got pushed out of a lot of the very professions that they had pioneered. Then a brief respite in World War II when they Rosie the Riveter and they take men's jobs. But as soon as the war ended, it was like a massive, again, another red scare, just like after World War I. 
and another um, um, attack on women is, um, you know, creating weak children, you know, overmothering and all of that, and um, somehow being responsible for potential ideological contamination through um, over, you know, turning the kids into sissies and things like that. And the 60s was the, just the beginning of fighting against that, um, and I just hit it at that moment when it was just still a cresting wave of, of fighting back against several decades of um, repression of women's rights and burying of women's history, burying. And one of the thing that's, things that was interesting was in the late 70s when I was studying women's history at Barnard, um, we were often reading books that had been written in the teens about women's history because that was the last time they had been written. So there were a number of books about medieval women and things like that that had been written in like 1912. And those were our sources. Now, your thinking was that your way of contributing to the feminist cause was mm -hmm. to be an historian. Mm -hmm. I'm curious how that fleshed itself out. I'm not you, sure. You, you know, I don't know if it ultimately worked that way, but I, I have a little hope that it still will. Um, because the first thing I, for me personally, it didn't work that way. I think it's worked for other people. Mm -hmm. I think there's lots of hugely important work um, about women in the French Revolution and, you know, women in you know, 19th century industrialization. Um, Jean Boydston's fabulous book, Home and Work, about the role of housework in industrialization. Um, you know, there's a, I, you know, I could talk, you know, Nancy Cott, everything she's written has been great. Um, she has a history of marriage. She has, she was my advisor at Yale when I went for graduate school. Um, her history of the 20s I use all the time uh, about what happened to the women's movement in the 20s. Her, her pioneering book, uh, Bonds of Womanhood, about the early republic. I mean, so there's a lot of great, great, great stuff. Um, and so I think it could work out, and I think it has worked out for some work. My first book was not maybe the best contribution because I um, was looking at uh, uh, women who created new religions. And I started writing about you know, Christian science and these sort of uh, New Age meditative groups from the late 19th century that women started. And it turned out they weren't you know, the best people to write about. They weren't quite the activists I'd hoped for and their thinking was quite flawed and you know, they're kind of obscure for a reason, I hate to say it. Even though their work, some of their books are still being read today, um, they were a particular strand that I looked at. And um, I didn't look at um, set, uh, activist women that I could have looked at. So my book probably didn't contribute that much, but I think my teaching contributes a great deal. I teach a history of women in the U.S. class that c covers two semesters, and I feel like every semester I am doing a huge service to the students in the class to teach them the whole long history that I was told did not exist. So, um, and I'm hoping in the future I'll um, write about feminist activists um, and their ideas and bring them into history and into intellectual history, because I actually like intellectual history the best, even though I don't write it that much these days, so I'm planning to do more of it. So, um, but I think it's an utterly legitimate and uh, helpful contribution. Anybody's history, you know, uh, you know, the history of elites is a contribution. If it, you know, it's, it's all about sort of using this vast thing that's behind us, you know, like people have gone through almost everything we've gone through, you know, and they already thought about it, and why can't we let people know about that? So, um, you know, I think, I think uh, obviously, I, I, I respect history as a profession, and um, and I think women, you know, 50% of the population, you know, are, anything that pretends they're not there is going to have, an, is obviously inevitably warped, and I would rather us have a true history that um, accounts for all the people, you know, who, who participated in thought and culture and politics uh, than a partial one that lionizes specific, um, you know, uh, the people that were already lionizing and just sort of traces, you know, the win they say the winners write history. And um, so in the 50s when certain kind of, you know, ma manhood was uh, lauded, then that was the history that was written. Some of it is good. 
Some of it is great. Some of it isn't. Um, but it, it sort of depends who's asking the question, what kind of history gets, gets, gets um, written. And I care a lot that my students are quite diverse. They're from my, my campus, Rutgers University in Newark. We have like 50-something languages spoken. We have the most um, diverse campus in the country for the last 14 years. And I, I love looking out at these students from all over the world and knowing and, and encouraging them all to ask questions and write histories from based on the issues um, that are of concern to them. So I think it will be extremely enriching. I was just thinking about the thing you said earlier, talking about the situation of women, which is, there isn't progress. <laughs> well, there isn't progress. Well, there is and there isn't. You know, I, don't, I mean, I say there's no such thing as progress. What I mean is there's no, there's no such thing as linear progress. It doesn't just like, you know, like my students, I always tell them, if you... At the beginning of the class, they're always like, well, we went from the kitchen to the boardroom, you know. And I tell them, if you guys say that at the end of the class, you fail, <laughs> you know, because that is not the trajectory, and it's, it's too simplistic, and it's wrong in every way, and it would mean that you would not understand how hist history works, you know. So um, I think there's been a lot of progress. I mean, my life is um, not much, much more, um, and, you know, infinitely more choices than my mother did. Um, but... Not complete progress. I mean, there's it, it, it's an ebb and flow at all times. And if you give up uh, and, and turn your back on continuing uh, expanding opportunities for people, those opportunities will close because there are plenty of people who would love to shut it down. And so um, that's more what I mean. I mean, I don't mean no progress at all, but uh, extremely uneven at best. And um, it's more about understanding. Like people, It's what uh, Martin Luther King said. He's like... You don't wait for progress. And he was always, you know, he was wonderful. He said, um, you know, <laughs> the people who are busy, you know, taking away your rights and, you know, enforcing segregation laws and figuring out new ways to write tax codes to, you know, funnel money to themselves. They don't just sit and wait for things to get better. They are active. You know, they're planning how to get what they need. And that's what everyone needs to do. So, um he, he often spoke against this idea of inevitable progress. He said that's a way to pacify people. And I think he's correct, and that's what I mean. And that's the picture of the, of the repressive forces you know, sort of being immortal and lurking and waiting to... Oh, right, not waiting, again. not waiting, acting. People are always acting on their own you know, behalf. And when only a small number of people have the um, resources uh, to act on their own behalf and the, um, you know clout to make it happen, they will, of course, assume that they're helping everyone, but actually be helping themselves. I mean, I think you need more voices, more people at the table. I think that was one of the big um, insights of feminism was that, you know, when it's only men writing the uh, history books, you get a distorted history. When it's only men doing the medical research, you get a distorted medical research. Only men writing the laws, the laws get distorted, et cetera, et cetera. And so they were just like, we have to bring more people in. And that holds, I think, across many divides, you know, not just gender. Um, you made a move from thinking about yourself as women's history mm -hmm. to this project with your father's mm -hmm. history and the thing that you were sort of on, in on the tail end of. I mean, the, it sounds like with the women's history stuff, you were you were riding a wave where you were tracking a line of development pretty clearly. Mm -hmm. you, you, could, you could kind of be part of right. a movement. And then but there was always a sense that there was a movement just before you came to consciousness that, I didn't know about. that was weird. So what, what, what nudged you Back to, over to that? Um, you know, it was uh, um, not uh, nothing obscure. It was um, a very specific event. My... My, my brother Paul, my older brother, when I was six, he was 16. So he was 16 when my father died. And he had gone to my father's law office and saved all these papers. And um, as a 16 year old, which I think is very impressive. And he would make scrapbooks out of them. And that was the little I knew about my father was mostly from reading these scrapbooks, which had newspaper accounts of his law cases, which involved housing. And I would um, read them whenever I had a chance. And I read them over and over, you know, but they were like that many, you know, I mean, there was like two or three scrapbooks and I read them all the time. 
and um, whenever I had a chance. And I was always very interested, and I would talk to my brother about my father. And But I could, you know, there's only so much I could piece together because the tiles were a little obscure and it was a little hard to follow. But um, 1999, when I had finished my first book and I had gotten tenure, Paul, for some reason, he was moving or something, and he had a whole carton. Uh, he had laid out this whole carton of of scrapbooks about my father and I was like oh my god it's a whole shelf you know and I was like I you know I never seen that before and I was I was like where did all this come from he said well I'm just shifting things around I'm just put it all in one place you know and I couldn't believe it you know and I thought I have tenure I have security I need to know you know so I took a carton of um, scrapbooks that my brother had made and I took them to a Xerox place and I Xeroxed everything and it was, I remember it came up to about 2,000 pages because I, you know, paid by the page. And um, that's what it came to. And and I just said, I'm going to look at this. And it was, I had the freedom. I had, you know, I had my book out. I had tenure. I had, you know, a little space. I didn't know quite what to do next. Um, and so I just started reading it. And as I started reading it, I was, and I, you know, I put it in order because I'm a historian. You know, my brother had made the scrapbook some, you know, some were thematic. And, you know, he just made them like a kid would make them. It was just, you know. Not exactly random, but not historical either. And I organized this stuff chronologically and then started reading it through. And the stories were just mind-boggling to me. They were, you know, these stories of housing exploitation and um, how African Americans were. I mean, the level of exploitation um, where you buy a house for, you know, fourteen thousand dollars that the speculator bought. A few weeks before for four thousand dollars. I mean, you know, I couldn't believe it. And then they throw them out by when they miss a payment, and my father's defending them, and he's saying all these impassioned and very to me. You know, I was like, well, this is really insightful. He's saying this is how our system works, and we don't understand it. And if we did, we could save the city. And I just thought, oh my God, this is incredible. You know, it's just so interesting. But I had no training. I did not study urban history. I didn't know anything about economics. I didn't know anything about Chicago, really. I mean, I'd studied 19th century women's history and early 20th century. And, um, and I didn't understand mortgages and I didn't understand p politics or banking. It was like everything I didn't study. Um, so I initially thought, well, I will, um, I'll, I'll turn the, you know, I, I made the copies. Paul doesn't want to give up, obviously, his, his source, his, his originals, but I will give them to an archive, and somebody will do it now that it's there. And then as soon as I thought somebody will do it, I actually like, felt a voice inside me saying, no, you do it. You know, you do it. I have to do it. And I just thought, okay, I guess I have to do it. Like, I, it, was, it was very powerful. And so then I just thought, well, I'm just going to have to do it. I mean, you know, I don't know how, I don't know. I don't understand this stuff. I'm not good at it. It's not my interest, really. I'm more of a novel type person, you know. But I just started reading, and um, I found that the training I had for intellectual and cultural analysis was pretty good to help me read these other things. I mean, to go from that to this very nitty gritty, you know, political economic stuff, um, it's actually it's also a little bit. It was a, it was a little drier, but actually easier. It wasn't as intellectually um, demanding in some ways. Um, and then I was reading all these um, sources. My father was very close with a number of newspaper reporters in the early 60s, in the, on the Chicago Daily News especially, which is now no longer in, in existence. And, um, and I was reading all the reporters. He would, you know, and I had his private letters, and I had his speeches, and I had everything, and I had the letters from the reporters saying, thank you so much for giving us all your stuff, and, you know, and him saying, I have more material, here's like some things, you know, he would pitch stories to them, and they would write them. And so, it based on his cases. So I had the newspaper reports that the reporters were making, um, and I saw how they turned his raw material into really compelling prose. And I, I remember I'd been sort of casting around, how will I write this, you know? And I decided, I'm gonna, these guys are giving me a great model, these Chicago Daily News reporters, they're brilliant. Not, not all men, women too. Uh, uh, Lois Willie was fabulous, uh, George Ann Geyer, um, Nick Schumann, um, uh, M.W. Newman. There were a number of men and women who were just hard-hitting, fabulous writers. And so I decided I'm going to do it the way they do it. I'm going to follow their style and just turn this into something. So that's, so it, was, it, it seems like a big break, but in the end it was sort of going back to where I started also because I always wanted to know this, 
you know? I was always curious what he had been doing. And I, I had this one weird experience where when I, I started making timelines because I couldn't, it was so much going on, I, you know, just to keep track of, um, you know, I had a timeline about urban renewal and a timeline about open occupancy laws, you know, I was making these timelines. And I had one about my father, what he was doing, because his speeches, you know, I was sort of marking them down. And I could see it getting busier and busier and crazier and crazier. And I was doing, you know, 56, 57, 58, 59, 60. And then I realized, oh, 59, that's the year I was born, you know. And, um, I, you know, I had done all his actions, but I didn't have done that he had a kid, you know, that year, his fifth, you know. And I thought that was um, funny. Like, I was like, oh, you know, I sort of fit here. Um, and then I think, well, that's why I don't remember him very well, you know, because in my early years before his death, he was very, very involved with fighting these massive battles. And, you know, I have these little child memories of him, but I, of course, could not understand um, what he was actually doing with this time, which was, you know, incredibly important. If there's any other questions, I'll historical records together with my own parents' mm -hmm. story, realizing what questions I should have asked yeah. back when they were alive yeah. and I could have asked. Right. Um, I'm wondering how that ultimately worked out for you, because, yeah. because you had considerable, considerably charged kind of emotions and questions around the death of your father. Mm -hmm. How did, uh, how did that come together for you as suddenly the timelines began to converge? Of uh, my life and his life. Yes, yes, and yeah. you began to sort of notice how, in, in, how, how what you were, the, the research you were doing bore on the questions you had when you were 10 or Yeah, 15. right, right. No, it was, it was great, actually. It was just so um, nourishing, in a way, you know, to find these things out. Um, you know, my mother had passed away already by the time I started doing this, so I did not have her to ask. I asked my um, brothers. I interviewed them in great length. I don't know if that's part of what you're asking me, but, but I, I talked to all the relatives, you know, the aunts and the uncles, and um, the first thing I actually did was track, try to track down the newspaper guys who had written about my father, and um, so I found some of them, and they led me to other people, you know, and it expanded, but... Um, so you're asking me how uh, it felt, or you're asking me how the procedure? I'm not, I'm not entirely well, sure. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm curious in a number of ways. I mean, I suppose partly it's just how it felt. I mean, mm -hmm. is this, what kind of an event was it personally mm -hmm. oh, to it was, finally yeah. get clarity? Yeah, yeah, on no, it was, it was it, wondering about, about in some time. way, yeah. yeah. No, it was fabulously interesting, and you know, well, first of all, I got to know my father for the first time. Uh, I, I uh, saw what kind of person he was. Um, I quickly learned that he had been quite rude and arrogant. Uh, and, um, and people would say to me, like, uh, you know, Mark Satter, he, if, if, you didn't, if you didn't follow him immediately, right away, he thought you were an idiot, you know? <laughs> uh, or, you know, he, 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 had a, um, he could be verbally pretty rough. Um, other people, of course, adored him, but as I started interviewing his friends and people who knew him, sometimes they'd say, well, I don't really want to say anything. And I'd say, I already know he was rude. I already know he was gruff. I already know that he alienated people. And they'd go, like, okay, okay. And then they would tell me, you know? <laughs> so um, there was that. But that, of course, didn't bother me. I mean, it was really interesting. And um, learning a little bit about his temper, I sort of felt like, I feel I have that temper, you know? And so I felt like, oh, that's where I got it, you know? Um, and uh, certain, you know, like I don't like, I don't watch TV, I don't like TV, and he, he didn't like TV, he didn't watch TV. He uh, made fun of sports, I, I, you know. There was all these little things that were sort of buried in my background that I was like, I recognize that. Uh, and so that was nice. Uh, it made me feel like I came from somewhere because uh, my mother and he were quite different people, and I was raised by my mother, not my father, and you know, she was a very gentle, loving, social, caring uh, person who would never hurt anyone or say anything mean ever. And I'm a little sharper tongued and my father certainly was. So um, it was a sense of self-recognition in many ways, uh, who he was. Um, and immense admiration um, for the fact that now at this very late date he could teach me so much. It was fabulous. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, 
um, you know, somebody stopped me today on the way here because I gave a little talk yesterday, and they, he said, uh, you know, thank you for your talk. And he said, um, because of your talk, I've looked up your father's um, pieces in the Chicago Defender. And I thought, God, that is so wonderful. You know, my father, uh, Mark J. Satter, had um, a column in the Chicago Defender, and he had articles in there, and, you know, all this stuff would be utterly forgotten if I hadn't dug it up. So um, it was, you know, deeply, deeply, deeply fulfilling, um, super illuminating. Um, you know, I got the full tragedy of his death in a way that, you know, I didn't before because I hadn't quite known how much he was doing when he died at the age of 49, so, um, and how desperately he wanted to live. Um, you know, I had, I started my, one of my aunts, his sister, his older sister gave me letters he had written to her that she had saved for like 40 years, and she gave them to me, um, and other people gave me letters, personal letters, so I got to read letters he was writing from his hospital bed when he was dying, and, um, you know, they were beautiful, and, you know, you, I, I finally understood what he went through, you know, um, in his last months. Um, and it was, you know, it was heartbreaking. But I think possibly at a psychological level, I think kids, when they lose a parent, um, tend to feel abandoned by the parent. It isn't rational, of course, but it is a child's way of understanding. Like the person was there and now they're gone and is it my fault? And, you know, there's a, I understand that psychology. And, um, and of course, I know better, you know, you don't abandon someone when you die, you die. But nevertheless, reading these accounts um, by him uh, helped really put that to rest, that this was someone who certainly did not want to abandon his five children and certainly wanted to live and couldn't. And, you know, that's what happened. So, um, but it brought, you know, made it all very three-dimensional, you know, and that um, you know, confusion around my early years is not, you know, became utterly clear what had happened. And that was um, something not many people, I think, have an opportunity um, to, to, to do. And I think many people want to, and that's why many people do talk to their parents and grandparents. And I would encourage anybody who hasn't yet to do so um, while they can. You know, um, I wasn't able to talk to them directly. I talked to my mother a bit. Uh, before she died, but I was only 24 when she died, and I didn't have, I had some questions, and she answered some things, but I missed a lot, too. Um, in my, own, my own situation uh, uh, was very palpable growing up, that my father was frustrated by having landed somehow in a career that left him with a lot less a less avenues for exercising his capacities mm -hmm. than uh, than would have been best. He, all of his stars went out. Mm -hmm. um, how close did your father come? I mean, I, I see to, you know, to, a lawyer, to, to 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 really being in the place where he could exercise the the full range of capacity and and passion and compassion I think, he Yeah, I think he, he, he went pretty far. He was, um, the ch you know, one of six child of immigrants. He was, um, I think, the only one of the six to go to college. Um, he, and he didn't really go to, he went to, um, in those days, you didn't have to get an undergraduate degree to go to law school. So he, he went to something called People's Community College, and then he went to DePaul and got his law degree, which he had by the time he was 21, or no, 23. So um, he didn't have your traditional, uh, but that was in the 30s. Um, but he, I think he, you know, he did immense good in the world. I think he died not knowing, because a lot of, it ha a lot of the uh, repercussions of his actions came after his death, and that was powerful for me to find out, because I thought, you know, he did. He 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 sounded the alarm about these exploitative real estate transactions, and then, you know, his heart gave way, and he died at 49, and that's the end of it. But it turns out that he talked to people who talked to other people who, after his death, created a whole movement. You know, and um, so I think he died not knowing how how much he had done, but he had done a great deal. He he became a lawyer. He 
always said he wanted to be a lawyer for the working man. He didn't want to help rich people collect their money. He wanted to help working people um, get their rights. And I think he succeeded in doing that. Um, by the late 50s, the working people he was working with were mostly African American, and he really um, had a lot of empathy for the new migrants coming in and saw them as fellow working people and not as somebody alien or different. Um, and had you know many, many black clients, and if they could pay, fine. If they didn't pay, fine. Um, he, I think, wanted to do more writing. Um, I could, from his papers, I can see that he was constantly pitching um, articles to all these magazines, and he got a lot of rejections. Um, and, I, and I think he would have, that was the one step he would have liked to have gone further, and he would have liked a national audience, and he only had a, a city audience. Um, but I think I've helped him get the national audience, you know, because I think more people are reading this book and they're reading about him and, and his analyses are quite brilliant and astute. So um, if he hadn't been cut down, you know, in his prime um, through this heart ailment, um, I think he, he, he was situated as an attorney to go further. Um, but the pressure's on him as someone with five children, a law practice where he didn't always get paid, uh, trying to ho maintain some properties in a neighborhood that was getting devastated by forces outside of his control. You know, it was a hard, hard road for him to, 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 to follow. And, um, but I, I don't think, I think he did find the right professional niche for himself. He just, his health didn't allow him um, to go forward. He also, of course, was quite um, an independent thinker and an independent actor. He you know, as the, everyone told me, he would dismiss you if you didn't, he didn't think you were smart enough. Mm -hmm. And um, so he didn't have the colleagues and support that a more uh, glad handy kind of person might have had. Um, so that's uh, how he lived his life. So, did anything shift in your sense of your own vocation after? your work with your father's materials and mm -hmm. this understanding of him as an activist. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I mean, it still doesn't make me want to be an activist because it's just not my character, but uh, it certainly taught me immense respect for activists and taught me that I could, can understand them. And not only that, they have so much to teach me. So rather than writing about religious leaders who I don't fully expect, respect, uh, because of limitations in their worldview, I am much more happy and excited to write about activists who are brilliant, who I do respect, who, I, who teach me as I write about them. Um, so that's the biggest shift. And also, you know, I realized I, 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 uh, the other book was sort of a critique of people who over-personalize you know, structural changes in the society around them. And I could have just spent all my time criticizing people who didn't get at the real mechanisms of power without ever looking at the real mechanisms of power. But that is what activists do. They try to get a handle on who makes the decisions, how do we change those, you know, those decisions, how do we leverage what we have to get things we need. And so learning about my father and his work and then the activists who came after him, I, you know, it's changed my focus. I want to write about those people. I want to write about women as well as men who, who, who are activists and who wage campaigns. Um, but um, I, I just have uh, infinitely more knowledge of, how, of, of, of what they go through, of, of the price they pay, infinitely more um, empathy and respect for them, and um, more confidence in myself that I can, in fact, follow. I can't do what they do, but I could report on what they do and bring um, a wider audience to their good work. And that's, what I, that's now how I see my historical work. So it may be that the work you do provides models for the next generation of activists. Yeah, because I'm trying to be a bridge. You know, I help them get in touch with their forebears that they have no other way of accessing. You know, as a historian, I can, I know how to dig, I know how to bring it out. And then, you know, anybody could pick up the book and read it and learn the way I have. So yeah, I, I do think I'm doing that and I, I hope so. And 
you know, today I was talking to some scholars here at University of uh, Minnesota, and they were, um, I, had, I had just finished writing this um, section of, uh, of a new project about black capitalism. And I laid out, it wasn't like two positions uh, among black power and black capitalist thinkers, it was like 20, you know, very rich debates they were having. This, and everyone was saying, oh my God, it's just like today. But you know, they, they thought it all through. And I was like, well, yeah, that's, that's why we do look. You know, because you know, <laughs> that's the whole point is that history is this resource if you are willing to listen and look. Um, and so I want to do that ongoing so that people can have access to uh, the past, the, de the debates of the past, see where they went wrong, where they went right. Um, and you know, use use that. It can't ever be a full guy because things are always changing. But there's certain, like you know, Martin Luther King, when he says, uh, when he talks about the nature of progress. I mean, that's as relevant today as it was when he was alive. And you know, we should have that council as we go forward. I still remember how, how surprised I was learning that in the early days uh, you reach Martin Luther King through armed guards on the porch, that it was Barry Rustin coming back from India that said, no, we can't do that. Hmm. <laughs> you go that route. <laughs> and I, I mean... You mean that he did civil disobedience? No, I mean, yes, the, the whole idea of civil disobedience was a matter of Martin Luther King meeting the right guy at the right time. Right. <laughs> and getting a bunch of ideas sort of back from Thoreau right, right. via India. Right, right. I <laughs> mean, it helped that he went to Boston University <laughs> and studied theology and got his PhD. He was, you know, someone who was knowledgeable enough to, when he heard an interesting idea, <laughs> to say, yes, this is good. Of course, he wasn't the only one. I mean, there were many other uh, people who were um, involved in pacifist activism, Bayard Rustin, and people in core, Congress of Racial Equality and stuff. But... You know, he was the right, you know, yeah, I mean, he, he had the um, leadership ability and the intellectual strength and the personal courage to uh, make use of this wildly transit, you know, uh, mig migratory <laughs> idea uh, of civil disobedience yeah. and then take it forward and transform, um, to some extent, you know, this country. Well, I mean, it's always dangerous to think about advice with historians because no, no ear is ever like any other and mm -hmm. all that, but what sorts of things have you learned about progressive activism, mm -hmm. about the sort of person who can pull it off, <laughs> about the sort of atmosphere that needs to be produced, created mm -hmm. for it to work? Right. I mean, you know, if those guards had not let the guy through, <laughs> it would have been all over for a lot of things, you know. Yeah, I mean, I think that um, some things I've learned uh, are that um, activism is best bottom up, not top down. So um, when elites try to formulate solutions, they tend to be. Um, you know, incomplete at best, if not downright dangerous uh, for people who are not elite. Um, so I have a lot of respect for community organizing where you get people together to talk about their experiences and formulate um, positions, um, you know, based on how they live because it's the people closest to the ground who know the realities there. And, um, but how it becomes effective is when, I mean, the problem is that those most um, closest to the ground are the, those with the least resources and the least time and the most pressure. So in the case of my book, Family Properties, I had um, you know, my father solo, solo trying to you know, give speeches and lectures and write and you know, just harangue people to tell them this bad thing is happening. But no real change happened until um, community organizers after his death went door to door and got the actual men and women who were buying on contract to come together and talk about what they experienced and what, and what kind of policy, you know, what kind of activism they wanted uh, to get a more just uh, deal on their properties. So, um, 
So on one hand, um, they will be, and my father ha had an understanding of um, people on the ground because, of course, they were his clients. But in the end, he's speaking for them as an attorney to some extent, not, not entirely, because they would say, well, here's what I want to do. Um, but if you have the on the ground, um, the people who are losing their homes, the people who are, you know, ha you know th 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 being evicted, whatever, um, getting them organized, the other crucial element is that there be other people willing to help them, whether it be doing property research uh, to present them with facts that they have questions about, or doing free legal aid, or um, offering a church so they can meet, or um, you know, offering childcare so that things could happen. So, it's uh, what was happening in the '60s was that you had a convergence of different forms of activism with, where they could help each other. You had legal aid activists willing to help these people. You, you had college students with a uh, progressive vision who were um, in college campuses that would give them credit for working with community organizations in you know, decaying entirely black communities. You had um, unions that were willing to give their um, support. You had um, churches this was, the Catholic Church was extremely progressive up until the late 60s when it went the other way. But um, for a while there, there were, you know, the Jesuits gave like a huge, uh, you know, like $100,000 in bond money to the contract buyers who were being arrested. You know, so you need that convergence um, of, of people um, in different, um, who are differently situated with different, uh, with different kinds of access whether it be to money or expertise, that are willing to share and listen and work with um, the people who are confronting, you know, the, the hardest um, conditions. And I think that's how change can happen. Um, I think if it's top down, um, then you get something like urban renewal. You get a bunch of wealthy businessmen saying, "Oh, it seems slummy out there. Let's just, you know, destroy the slums and give me the money, and I'll build a." high rise and you know it'll be great you know we'll get rid of the slums and I'll make a fortune it's like well sure that'll work great <laughs> you know <laughs> what happens to the people whose uh, homes are demolished uh, not our problem you know uh, put them in public housing that's you know created by some you know corrupt management that's in cahoots with the city government and only placed in already overcrowded neighborhoods um, that's how it works out because there was no input from the people who lived in those communities as to the fate of those communities and therefore the fate of those communities was you get wiped out. Um, so that's how I think it needs to be and I think um, it's very hard if you don't have secondary supporting groups whether it be religious bodies or um, students or um, you know people with various kinds of expertise and I mean social workers aren't going to cut it if their understanding of the situation is, you know, it's a psychological problem or a strictly individual problem. So you have to give people a chance to um, explain their own situations uh, for there to be um, any kind of positive response to the problems they face. How, are you, how, how much, if at all, are you tempted to focus on things, stories that, that haven't come to a conclusion yet. I mean, you, well, one knows that there's historians to deal with the past. Yeah. And yet, Occupy Wall Street and Black Lives Matter and so forth, the, 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 the material is so much richer if you don't wait. You mean contemporary work? Yeah, contem contem you know, the, the animal rights movement in Austria is the most exciting thing I've ever seen. Mm -hmm. you know, and, and what's well, exciting about it is, is it isn't finished yet. You know? Well, um, nothing's really ever finished, you know. But, but, it, but you, there, I'm just thinking historians, I, I mean, I, the, the historians I talk to want to think about you know, at least some preliminary end such that they can say, okay, now we can go back and, and see what back, happened. What happened. Right. So how do you come down on that? Well, again, I don't think things ever end, you know. Um, like I said, there was this women's movement in the teens, and then it got buried, and then in the 70s, we were reading them again, and it came back, you know. Um, so, and even my father's story, uh, he died in 1965, that seemed to be the end of the story. And then it turned out that it wasn't, that even after his death, he had this 
massive influence on these other activists who knew him personally, who said when I interviewed them, well, Mark Satter came and he explained this to me and it blew my mind and then I realized I had to do this and this and this. Well, I lost track of him, but here's what I did. And, you know, so, um, and some of them said that in writing and, and things I'd never seen, you know, like in interviews. Uh, John McKnight saying, you know, um, who, who, who uh, was an organizer in Chicago, um, mentioning um, in an interview that I only saw when I was researching the book, well, you know, you want to know how I got into this? There was this guy named Mark Satter, and he showed up once at this place, and he told me this story, and I couldn't believe it, you know, about housing and real estate. So um, I think in some sense we don't know uh, the end. Um, I, there is a difference between history and contemporary um, work, and uh, if you're looking at, say, Occupy Wall Street, you know, you might think it was a one or two year thing, and then it could turn out that it was people influenced by that who went, you know, five years in the future were gonna, you know, be reborn in another way. So, um, we just don't know. Uh, I'm, my new book is about, which I'm working on, is about South Shore Bank, which um, came Shore Bank, a bank holding company that did community development, and they started in the, in 1973, and they went under in 2010. So 2010 is pretty contemporary, you know? And it's a little hard to know where to stop. I mean, I could just keep going, you know? Uh, because I ended 2010 when they went under, but what about all the stuff that came after, you know? So I'm gonna just have to play that by ear, you know, how far into the future I go. But I tell my students that we need about 20 years for something to be seen as historical because um, a, we need to sort of have a little bit of sense of what happened in terms of where did it go? You know, where did that movement end up? You know, did it seem to succeed or not? But more importantly, it just takes that long for um, records to become available, for people to be willing to talk, um, for some lone journalist or historian to make the first stab at contextualizing the, what it, whatever it is you're writing about. You just need a little body of scholarship, you know, to, to pull it together. So I'm pushing the far boundaries by going up to 2010. It's quite recent. It's not really history. But, you know, given that this, you know, catastrophe of 2008 and the huge number of books about it, I think I could do it through those books. Um, so we'll see. Thank you. Thank you.